Hi everyone, welcome back and if you haven't been here before, my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student from UCL. So today I thought I'd talk about obsessive compulsive disorder. So I'm going to briefly go through the diagnostic criteria for the disorder and then go through the psychological and biological theories that relate to it. So this involves having either obsessions, compulsions or both. So obsessions are persistent thoughts, urges or images that seem to cause distress or anxiety for the individual. The individual also attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts due to the distress that they cause. Some individuals try to neutralise this obsession with another thought or action which could be seen as compulsive behaviour. So a compulsion could be sort of repetitive behaviour or mental act that an individual feels they must do. This might be in relation to an obsessive thought or some sort of rigid rule that they feel they have to succeed with. Repetitive behaviours include hand washing, checking or ordering. Mental acts involve praying, counting or repeating words silently. I think the main thing with compulsions is this. Their behaviours or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some sort of dreaded event or situation. However, this behaviour or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralise or prevent or are clearly excessive. These obsessions or compulsions need to be time consuming so they are at least being performed one hour a day or they need to have significant distress that affects functioning, whether that's social, occupational or interrelational within the day. These obsessive compulsive symptoms are not related to any other kind of drug use or any other kind of mental disorder. So then we have to specify whether this individual has good or fair insight where they think that their obsessions or compulsions are probably not true or whether they have poor insight and they think that there might be a chance that it is true or whether they're completely absent of insight or have delusional beliefs and are completely consumed by believing that it must be true. In terms of the ICD-10 2019 criteria, they say that you can either have predominant rumination or obsessive thoughts, predominant compulsions or a mixture of both obsession and compulsive behaviours. So firstly, I'm going to talk about biological theories behind OCD. So firstly, genetics. Research suggests that 25% of individuals with OCD also have a family member with OCD. Also, if you have an identical twin who has OCD, the risk of you having OCD ranges from 45 to 65%. Now I'm going to talk about its relation to brain circuits. So one example is the circuit relay system. And this is relating to different parts of the brain, such as the orbitofrontal cortex, cingulate cortex, and the caudate nucleus of the basal ganglia. So these areas are related to complex behaviours such as emotional regulation, reward-based decision-making and goal-directed behaviour. This relay system is also related to the thalamus. So thinking of the basal ganglia, which is associated with functions such as cognition and voluntary motor movements, when this circuit is activated, the impulses that an individual has with OCD are brought to your attention and cause you to perform a particular behaviour that appropriately addresses the impulse. For example, after using the restroom, you may begin to wash your hands to remove any harmful germs you may have encountered. Once you have performed the appropriate behaviour, in this case, washing your hands, the impulse from this brain circuit diminishes and you stop washing your hands and go about your day. So it's suggested that individuals with OCD have difficulty ignoring or reducing the activity in this circuit and this will cause obsessional thoughts or compulsive behaviour. Increased activity in these regions, the orbitofrontal cortex, the cingulate and the striatum at rest, has also been shown to be especially increased in those with OCD when exposed to feared stimuli. So this suggests that when you're exposed to a fearful stimuli, if you have OCD, you're more likely to have increased activity in this circuit area compared to those who do not have OCD. And also this activity is more likely to be sustained and therefore you might feel like you have to carry on doing those compulsive behaviours or you won't be able to suppress those obsessional thoughts. While SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have been seen as a successful medication for individuals with OCD, the specific mechanism which is involved is not really clear from the research. In the future, it's best to combine neuroanatomical, genetic, as well as a neurotransmitter evidence, so increase or decrease of dopamine, glutamate and serotonin to see how this all fits together. But for now, it seems the strongest research seems to be activation in this circuit of the brain. So now I'm going to talk about cognitive theories of OCD and how CBT can be used in treatment. So specifically for CBT, it's not exactly how the thoughts came across in the first place, but it's what we think of the thought and how we react to them. So according to cognitive behaviour theories, 
It suggests that everyone in the world sometimes experiences bizarre or uncontrollable thoughts. Those who are vulnerable to OCD find it harder to decrease their attention to these thoughts. Also, some individuals with OCD may believe that you should be able to control these thoughts and that they're dangerous. So one example is you might believe that having these thoughts means you're going crazy or that you might actually carry out the imagined or feared behaviour, such as stabbing your partner. And because these thoughts are labelled as dangerous, you remain vigilant and watchful of them, just as you might constantly look out the window if you heard there was a burglar in the neighbourhood. Being trapped in this cycle can make it very difficult, if not impossible, to think outside of the cycle. And this is when it becomes an obsessive thought. Compulsions are learned behaviours due to these obsessive thoughts. So you may believe that you're dirty and then you condition yourself to wash your hands afterwards. And then this is a learned behaviour that you feel you need to do every time that situation arises. As you reduce your anxiety because you no longer feel like you are contaminated in some way, you reinforce the behaviour of washing your hands. This means that every time you come across this obsessive thought, you focus on it, you get anxious because you can't control it and you feel the need to do the compulsive behaviour because you feel it's the one way that you can reduce your anxiety. Now I'm going to say a quote that I think is really important when you're thinking about cognitive behaviour models. So the cornerstone of the cognitive model is the premise that the experience of intrusive thoughts is essentially universal. Research suggests that over 90% of a non-OCD student population experienced intrusive thoughts that were similar to those reported by OCD individuals. What differentiated people with OCD from those without OCD is a tendency for the former to interpret or appraise the intrusive thought as an impending threat. That is, the intrusive thought does not produce the anxiety and the need to neutralise the threat through compulsive behaviours. So here's a few of the bullet points that individuals may target when going through CBT. So one target is overestimation of danger, and that is defined as judging catastrophic outcomes as much more likely than they actually are in reality. So this is challenged by techniques that include an odds ratio, which is a listing all the events that would need to occur prior to the worst feared outcome and the probabilities associated with each. This figure is then compared to the probability for the worst feared outcome that is generated prior to beginning the challenge. Secondly, another target would be overestimation of the consequence of danger. And this is defined as imagining the result of a situation to be much more severe than it would be in reality. An example of how we could challenge this would be listing all the steps that would need to occur before the worst feared outcome and then seek out an expert in the field who would provide accurate information type direct questions such as if the name and account number do not match on a bank transfer, does the transfer go through? Behaviour experiments are another useful tool to test the consequence of danger. Example would be write out a bank transfer for a small amount with a name and account number that do not match to determine if the transfer will be completed. Although challenging these appraisals can be helpful, it's seen that these individuals may continue to conduct this compulsive behaviour. An example for this increased anxiety, even when going through these behavioural experiments, is that the risk is too high. So by saying that, individuals will realise that although the feared outcome is unlikely to occur, if it does occur, it may have severe consequences. Therefore, successfully challenging these danger appraisals would theoretically lower the probability of the outcome, but for a change in behaviour and anxiety to occur, these consequences must be challenged in order for them to have a lowered sense of danger. Now I'm going to talk about inflated personal responsibility as another target. This involves assuming blame for things that are not entirely in your control or completely aren't in your control. So one way to challenge this is pie charting and that involves brainstorming all the possible people or situations that could play a role in the outcome of the event and having the individual make a percentage of responsibility for each person with the responsibility allotted to the person with OCD noted last. Then the percentage responsibility of themselves in the pie chart would be compared with the responsibility percentage they believe they had before the task was done to see how there was a big difference. 
Also, it's about having a double standard approach where the individual thinks that if this happened to someone else, how much would they say it was in that person's control and see the difference between this objective outlook and the subjective outlook if that was to occur to them. So this is an example of the different appraisals an individual with OCD might think and how it relates to how they see themselves and also the different areas that CBT could target or challenge in order to modify these obsessive thoughts that would lead to compulsive behaviours. I don't want to go into too much detail on all of the other things that could be used as a target or different kinds of techniques used by CBT. So I'm just going to show briefly a diagram that explains all the different ways that OCD can be targeted by this treatment. So looking at faulty appraisals, this would be the overimportance of thoughts, danger or the consequence of danger, inflated responsibility, overestimation of the consequences of responsibility and the need for certainty and control over thoughts. So now I'm going to talk about exposure response prevention and how that's different to CBT. So ERP is basically facing your fear that you have the most and instead of doing the compulsive behavior that you would usually do to reduce your anxiety, you ride out that feeling. So obviously you wouldn't expose yourself to a situation that you'd fear the most, but this would be a gradual process where you increase the amount of fear you can tolerate. So you can see and gain confidence in how much fear you can tolerate at a specific time. It basically means increasing your confidence so you feel that you don't have to do this compulsive behavior and you can actually tolerate this anxious feeling. So basically ERP is learning to tolerate that anxious feeling, whereas CBT challenges the beliefs that you may be feeling when you're exposing yourself to that fear situation. So while ERP is the most commonly used therapy for this disorder, individuals in the UK usually first line of treatment would be cognitive behaviour therapy. So now I'm going to talk about psychodynamic theories of why OCD might occur and maybe some of the treatment that you might focus on with this model. So individuals with OCD, according to this theory, have some sort of unconscious conflict that causes these obsessive thoughts or compulsive behaviour. So this is when you have an unconscious wish that differs from socially accepted behaviours. So when this conflict is extremely repulsive or distressing, an individual redirects this to a more manageable task such as ordering, checking or hand washing. Some psychodynamic approaches suggest that when individuals are aware of these unconscious conflicts, they're more likely to be able to reduce their anxiety and behaviours. So more research really needs to be done on this kind of approach and when individuals are unaware of this conscious conflict, it can be harder to see what conflict this might be and how this relates to the compulsive behaviour that is being done. So now I'm briefly going to talk about acceptance and commitment therapy as a last model slash treatment option that's available for these individuals. So ACT aims to increase psychological flexibility and that's the ability to contact the present moment without restraints, without the existing context in order to change or persist in value driven actions. Responding rigidly to internal experiences referred to as psychological inflexibility can be problematic because it restricts behaviour and opportunities for external reinforcement which would result in a lower quality of life. Increasing this flexibility involves six different processes and that includes acceptance, diffusion, self as context, present moment awareness, values and committed action. One systematic review actually suggested that ACT could be as effective as CBT as a treatment option. This study also quantitatively analysed the effect size for 63 different studies that looked at psychological flexibility and its relationship to OCD behaviours and symptoms. And they found there was a significant relationship between acceptance questionnaires and basically psychological flexibility and OCD symptoms. So this does really show that there is a link between these two things and might explain the effectiveness of ACT. So I know this was a bit of a summary and the reason for the shortness of it was because I know there's a lot of content relating to the different kinds of therapeutic models involved. I hopefully you found this helpful and if you have any questions then please comment below. Thank you so much for watching, please subscribe if you enjoyed this video and please comment if you have any ideas or future videos I could do. Have a nice day!